stuff. So uh, conflicts. Uh, I do some work for uh, a pair of Canadian companies, Altus and Talc, who have technologies for dissolving things that can't be dissolved. Uh, I've been helping Pion, who make Remy Mezalam and Medtronic, who amongst other things make capnography. My objectives today are to very briefly introduce Remy Mazalam as a licensed sedative. I stress that because I'll also mention off license use. I'll discuss the concept of benzodiazepine anesthesia and maybe look ahead a little bit as well. Uh, much of what I'm going to cover can be found in this BJA review, which came out uh, earlier this year. And in particular, if you're interested in the simulations that I'm going to show, um, the details of the models and the simulations by Pedro Gambus and by Anne Rigby Jones can be found in that review. So this is my one slide lecture on Remy Mazalam, which kind of says it all. I'll try to make every word count here. So it's water soluble. It's a benzodiazepine. It's just like midazolam, but it has a quicker onset and offset. It's broken down by tissue esterases and it's metabolite is to all intents and purposes inactive. So that's kind of the whole story really. But to get into the detail a little bit, um, let's think about onset and recovery. Now you're all clinical pharmacologists, so you know exactly what happens when you give a propofol bolus. We have a peak effect in the blood and we have after a lag, a peak effect in the CNS. And the slides I'm gonna show next are all basically normalized to 100% of peak CNS effect. So this is the history of opioid pharmacology and anesthesia during my own career. So Alfenton and I started anesthesia at the same time in 1983. It was new, I was new. Uh, 30 years later, here we are. So we've shifted from fentanyl with a peak effect around four minutes uh, and the propensity for accumulation to alfentanyl with a much faster onset and finally remifentanyl with uh, very rapid offset as well. So that, if you like, is progress in opioid anesthetic pharmacology during that term. And in a similar vein, here are three hypnotics. The brown dashes are remimazolam. Pardon. The brown dashes are midazolam. The black line is remimazolam. And the green dots are propofol. And I draw to your attention a few things. So this is, if you like, progress in benzodiazepine anesthetic pharmacology of late. And I've stuck in here uh, remifentanil in the light blue, the thin line. So what can we say about remimazolam from simulations and from actually from experience with volunteers as well? The first thing we can say it's onset is much quicker than midazolam, but it's not as quick as... We can say that its offset is much faster than midazolam, but it's slower than propofol. Now, I think this is something that we can all help with is about names. I've already noticed people starting to refer to this compound as Remy, which I think is a really, really bad idea and is going to lead to trouble downstream for certain. We need to remind ourselves and remind our colleagues that Remy Mazalam is a benzodiazepine and Remy fentanyl is an opioid. They've got similar names, but different pharmacology, different effects, different profiles. And I think the second key point is to manage expectations about the offset. So they're both broken down by the esterases, but the spectacularly quick offset of remifentanil isn't mirrored. Uh, the offset of remimazolam is quick, but it's not as quick. So looking at the sedation domain, uh, for anesthesiologists, you're focused on propofol, which has quick onset and recovery at the, at the cost of hypotension, airway and special skills required. Benzodiazepines, slower, blood pressure maintained, airway maintained, easy to use, and there is a reversal agent. We think about our colleagues as proceduralists versus your anesthesiology sedationists. Anesthetists have expert knowledge of pharmacology. They know what you mean when you mention PKPD. They've got great skills in the airway and resuscitation, and they default to propofol, like the lady in the photo. Our proceduralist surgical and gastroenterologist endoscopists, for example, are focused on the procedure. Their pharmacology, at least in the sedation domain, is understandably patchy. They have no idea what you're talking about when you mention PKPD. The airway and recess skills are variable, and they default to midazolam. Uh, and then I just, just made a note there about the massive upsurge of 
propofol sedation service in the United States for colonoscopy in particular, which trebled, more than trebled in a decade. Now this is one of two pivotal phase three studies, which are what have led to the license in the United States for remimazolam as a sedative. And when I first read them, I kind of hated everything about them. It took me a while to figure out and to understand that actually the design is essentially dictated by the FDA. So they're not what you might have set up yourself, but they're, they're following the necessary pathway for a regulatory program. So the first one is in bronchoscopy. This is the Pastis study. There were three groups. So the left-hand two boxes, the dark blue and the maize-colored one in the middle uh, were double-blinded to receive either remimazolam or a saline placebo. And the placebo patients could be titrated with more placebo and eventually rescued with any amount of midazolam that the clinician chose to give. And then the third group was open label midazolam given very pedantically in very small and cautious doses following literally the US prescribing information, which has very small doses and very small steps. It's important to internalize those facts because they sort of explain what you see when you look at what happened. So this is sedation and the graph, the horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is the MOAS score. Uh, level four, lethargic response to the name, I've marked it on the y-axis. If we start with, first of all, the uh, gray dots, we can see that there is a quick onset of sedation down to the target level. The procedure's done, and there's a quick recovery. That's the remy Mazlam group. The patients given midazolam as per the US prescribing information, get there, but it's a slow old process, takes a long time, and then they take a good long time to recover as well. And the patients in the placebo group, understandably, don't get sedated by placebo. Eventually, everybody gets fed up at about 10 minutes, and they get larger doses of midazolam, and therefore they get sedated relatively quickly. And the second point is I've just marked in with colored arrows the moments at which the endoscopies began. And you can see that all three treatment groups, the actual depth of sedation at the time of starting the procedure was about the same. So in this arcane FDA guided study, the primary endpoint was a composite of completing the bronchoscopy without rescue and without an excessive number of top-ups. And by this set of criteria, Remy Mazan was more successful. Unsurprisingly, placebo was pretty useless and midazolam was effective, but not in the, the game that was being played here as useful. So Remy Mazalam had a shorter onset of action. There was slightly more hypotension in the groups other than Remy Mazalam, but there are statistical inefficiencies about some of the comparisons here. So I think you need to be cautious. And then there's a second large phase three study using the same template, this time for colonoscopy, it's the same design, Remy Mazalam versus placebo with rescue or open med label midazolam given painfully slowly by the US dosing recommendations, but the exact same structure. This is published by Dr. Rex. The composite endpoint, the same, complete procedure, no rescue and not too many top-up doses. And the conclusions are broadly similar, that Remy Mazalam worked well, that the onset was quick, and the offset was quick. So that is essentially what has underpinned your US license. And finally, a third study here, this is actually from China uh, and was published pretty recently and is not a regulatory study. And it compares a solid, some would say an overdose of propofol, 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams with Remy Mazalam. And you can see at the sedation scores that the propofol group were significantly more deeply sedated than the Remy Mazelam patients because it, an apple has been compared to some extent with an orange. We look at the timings. You can see that with that hefty dose of propofol, they are unsurprisingly sedated a bit quicker. And in the, in the recovery phase, the Remy Mazelam patients actually recovered a little more swiftly, but they were starting from a different baseline. So the usual problems of comparing apples and oranges and equipotent doses persist in this type of trial. 
what we do know is in that study, there was a lot more hypotension and respiratory depression in the profile patients, which is perhaps not surprising. So at that point, that is the, the package that underpins the license in the United States. Uh, we know that remuzolam has a faster onset and recovery than midazolam. It has less hypertension than propofol as a sedative. Doesn't seem to need an anesthesiologist. Blood pressure and airway appear to be maintained and it's easy to use. It's not indicated or licensed for ICU sedation, though I guess there's the possibility of a program in due course. And it's not indicated or licensed in the States for anesthesia, although it's fast onset and recovery have been demonstrated in programs in Korea, Japan, and China. So now I'm going to look into benzodiazepine anesthesia, but I want to start with comments from Dr. Sessler last year, who reminded us the hypertension during and after induction basically comes from drugs. It's presumably largely preventable. And this in the context of the strong association between perioperative hypertension and harm to patients. This is one of several similar outputs. This one comes from the BGA and it proposes a threshold for organ injury due to hypertension with the mean arterial pressure less than 80 for 10 minutes. And from Dr. Sessler's team, there are suggestions of maybe a systolic pressure less than 90 for 10 minutes. But you can argue about the numbers, but the bottom line is that hypertension is a bad thing. There's obvious stuff, don't let the blood out, get the fluids right, think about your epidurals, don't give too much stuff. And the top right up here is my favorite surgical procedure. I think it's the only operation in which you can be really confident that surgeons won't let all the blood out. It's a finger operation under a tourniquet and a ring block. So where do benzodiazepines fit in as a possible contribution to anesthesia? If we go back to 1966, when England last world that won the World Cup, diazepam was being evaluated as a general anesthetic. Now, diazepam is a white powder that does not dissolve in water. If you shake it up with some water, you get a kind of crunchy soup, uh, which nevertheless can be and has been injected, and perhaps unsurprisingly, it hurts. What I think is interesting is in this study reporting diazepam as an induction agent for general anesthesia. If you look in the green box that I put on the screen, you can see there's no change in the arterial blood pressure before and after induction of anesthesia with the diazepam. So a strong indication that benzodiazepine anesthesia is a stable condition. A few years later, Dr. Reeves reported using midazolam as a general anesthetic induction agent with less pain, bigger doses, it worked faster. There was cardiovascular stability both with midazolam and with diazepam. And he commented that midazolam was a promising anesthetic induction agent meriting further study. And it did indeed get further study. Here's John Dundee, legendary Belfast investigator, uh, not shy to give a colleague 10 milligrams of midazolam in the morning in a volunteer study and have them do an operating list in the afternoon. He commented on the lack of cardiovascular toxicity of midazolam, but then went on to say there was great individual variation which placed limits on its use as an induction agent. So the question is, can we use the benzodiazepine to induce anesthesia? The answer is definitely yes. That doesn't mean that it's useful. So a little later, an attempt to if you like, nail down the jelly. Small study, but testing propofol with alfentanil for induction and maintenance against midazolam with alfentanil with or without flumazenil at the end. If we look at the blood pressures, I've colored green, the shaded area, which are the propofol patients. And I put an orange line for the arterial blood pressures of the benzodiazepine midazolam patients. And you can see that there was consistently lower blood pressure in the patients anesthetized with propofol than was the case with midazolam. We get to the end of the case, when it comes to waking up time, the green circle is the propofol patients opening their eyes in four minutes. The midazolam group took more than half an hour. And even when they were given flumazenil, it still took 10 minutes with the risk of resedation. So I think that takes us to the point where general anesthesia with midazolam is technically possible, but not useful. And it's for that reason it hasn't seen general deployment. 
So that then begs the question where is where might Remy Meslam fit into this territory? There are a couple of studies from Japan, uh, from DOI and fellow investigators. This one looks at two doses of Remy Meslam given for infusion induction of anesthesia compared with propofol, all with Remy fentanyl. Their patients went off to sleep in about the same time. The Remy Maslam patients were a little slower, but it was only a few seconds and certainly not a in clinically important difference. Here's the biospectral index going down in all the groups with arguably the prep for patients very slightly deeper. Interesting electrophysiology questions as to whether you're actually measuring the same thing. If you look at drug-related adverse events, there was a lot more hypotension and hypotensive events in the profile group. Hmm. When it comes to waking up, the Remy Mazalan patients were a bit slower. So that is the demonstration of uh, Remy Mazalan to induce and maintain anesthesia. And I haven't seen a study properly yet, but I think there's an interesting question about its potential role for use as an induction agent. Many of you will have colleagues who choose to give etomidate, for example, to unstable patients. And I wonder if this might be an area that could be explored. So here's a study from last month, uh, also this time from China, looking at Remy Maslam in patients undergoing valve replacement, so a high risk group. They're put to sleep with Remy Maslam or propofol and sufentanil. They went on to a bizarre maintenance scheme that's not relevant to this discussion. They showed that the blood pressure fall was greater in the profile patients who also had more hypotension and required more epinephrine. Now going back to the start of the cases, this Kaplan-Meier plot is about induction of anesthesia in the DOI study. At the top left, everybody's awake. At the bottom right, everybody's asleep. And the two colored lines are elderly and non-elderly patients. So they basically all go off to sleep at the same speed with infusion induction of Remy Maslam in about two and a bit minutes. And if you look at patients with different body mass index, there are differences, but they're not very substantial. A large European study of uh, induction and maintenance of anesthesia with Remy Maslam in comparison with propofol completed last year, but has not yet been published. So we're dependent on a press release which summarizes it for the purpose of, if you like, investors rather than for scientists. That reported that Remy Maslam was non-inferior to propofol for induction and maintenance of anesthesia and had superior hemodynamic stability. And that is all the news that there is at the moment. And finally, finally on the sort of storytelling side, here's another study from Japan, a couple of case reports of super elderly patients, this time with fracture neck of femur, one of 95 and one of 103, and everything went, went well. So, I think we're agreed that perioperative hypertension is really bad, both during and after surgery. I just want to flag up the fact that we haven't ever really thought about hypertension during surgery, during sedation, and maybe it's time we should. Here's some unpublished data of 400 patients having propofol sedation for colonoscopy, normalized to their baseline blood pressure. And you can see that in the vast majority, the pressure goes down, a small number of the pressure goes up, but most of it goes down. And a proportion of these patients are having drops in blood pressure of magnitude and duration, which in the perioperative surgical patient is associated with bad outcome. Whether any such relationship exists during sedation is unknown territory, because frankly, as far as I can tell, nobody's looked, but I think it's something worthy of consideration. So I'll finish there. Here's my slide of progress in benzodiazepine pharmacology. And I think the shape of the curves illustrate the kind of thing that Remy Maislam may yet prove useful for. Thank you for your time and thank you for your attention.